music. It's very quiet today. <laughs> um, well, good morning and welcome as we come to the wrap up of our study of the last uh, several weeks of the book of of Ruth. I'm glad you are here with us. And I want to begin just by addressing a couple of questions that you might be asking. Um, first, why are there two of you on stage? Um, is the obvious Hi. question. And uh, many of you know Gretchen. Um, Gretchen <laughs> is uh, leads um, our high school ministry along with Tom Ward, our co-leader of that ministry. And she's a gifted teacher. Um, she loves to study God's word, loves to communicate the gospel. And, and so um, she's equipped and qualified to be up here, but we're excited to hear from her this morning. And secondly, um, we have been studying this book that has been told from the uniquely kind of this, this male and female perspective, um, where we've been looking at it through the eyes of, of a character like Boaz and what he's seeing and what God's calling him to and what that means for him to follow in obedience, but also through the lens primarily of Ruth and Naomi. And so this morning, as we kind of draw all of this together, we wanted to include both of these perspectives as we talk about the implications in, in our modern faith, in our efforts to, to follow Jesus. What are the implications of what Ruth has taught us in, in our lives? And we want to include both of these perspectives. The second question that I wanted to address is why have we taken six weeks to unpack this rather small story in the middle of the Old Testament. Why, why have we spent the time to look at this? I've been thinking of it this way. I, um, when I was a kid, um, I was growing up in the, in the early 80s when the Transformers were all the rage. Anybody out there have a Transformer when they were a kid? <laughs> Um, like this was kind of on the onset of this and so my brother and I were really into the Transformers We loved them and one Christmas we both asked for Transformers for Christmas and my brother opened his up and he got He got the Transformer everybody wanted. He got Optimus Prime Leader of the Autobots, right? Transformed into a semi-truck um, Was the cool Transformer. I got a Transformer by the name of Perceptor Anybody know what Perceptor transforms into? A microscope. <laughs> Literally, I got the transformer that was designed for nerds. Like, That's so embarrassing. Yes, it, it was. I, I, I was like researching this a little bit, and, mm -hmm. and there was like a poll on, online about the lamest Transformer, and Perceptor came in number one. <laughs> and that's the one I got. But I was thinking about the one, the one redeeming value of this transformer was it was actually like a, a functioning microscope. I, not to a very high degree, but it would, you could magnify stuff and, and you could get this sort of up close look. And so my brother and I would, we would take like my Barry Larkin baseball card and we'd put it under the microscope and we would see like the individual ink drops. Or we would take a rock from outside and put it under the microscope and we'd see all the detail of it. We would always say to each other, I wonder what, I wonder what this looks like up close. I wonder what this looks like when, when we zoom in. See, this, this, the Old Testament, as, as we read this, the Old Testament has been giving us this, this grand redemptive story that God is telling. It's been giving us this sense of God's activity and work to, to take the brokenness that was a result of sin and rebellion and all of that and saying how he is moving to bring us back into relationship with him, the relationship that we were created for. And the book of Ruth, it's, it's allowing us to zoom in into this grand redemptive narrative. It helps us to see from the perspective of this family living in Bethlehem thousands of years ago. The whole, the, the, the whole story of Ruth helps us to understand the big story that God is telling. The book of Ruth reminds us that our story, our stories are a part of a, a bigger story, a story that God is telling. It reminds us that, that God is not done redeeming. He, he's not done with his work of, of paying the price to restore our brokenness. And so when we started this book these weeks ago, we, as you might remember, it started up as kind of a hopeless picture. We have Ruth and we have Naomi. Naomi's husband has died and her two sons have died and she is left with two daughters-in-law. 
And the one daughter-in-law, Ruth, makes this faithful declaration that she is gonna go with Naomi against all logic, against what would be better or smart for her. She says, no, I'm coming with you. And so they go together to Bethlehem, and when they're there, they decide um, that Ruth is going to glean in the barley fields, which is basically her following the workers around, trying to scrape by enough for them to survive and for them to get by. Well, Ruth, her faithfulness is on display and it's becoming well known in the community. And so Boaz, the owner of this field, takes notice. And Boaz begins to lavish on her these abundant gifts and more. Boaz decides to take them under the favor of his wings. He's protecting these women. And then it gets uh, even better than that because we realize that Boaz is eligible to be what we call a guardian redeemer. He is a family member who can not only protect these women, but who can marry Ruth and invite them into his family and he can redeem the land that they once owned. And so in the last week we saw Boaz was negotiating with this other man who was eligible to be a redeemer and through Boaz um, he is quick and clever but he also has really strong character and at the end of this negotiation he ends up being the one to redeem the women and then at the end of this last scene these um, elders are blessing what has happened they're blessing the union of Boaz and Ruth and this is what they say in their blessing I'm reading from uh, verse 11. We are witnesses. May the Lord make the women, the woman who is entering your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built the house of Israel. May you be powerful in Ephrathah and your name well known in Bethlehem. May your house become like the house of Perez, the son Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring the Lord will give you by this young woman. And so this blessing, if you unpack it, is actually pretty radical because the stories that they are referencing, these are the pillars of their family, of the Israelite people, these stories right here. And so essentially what the elders are saying is this crazy, unexpected, and amazing thing that God did before, may that be the case for your family as well. And it's interesting because as they're laying down this blessing, they reference the story of Tamar, which we talked about a little bit last week. But what's important to note about that is this isn't the first time that God has taken an outsider, a foreigner, a woman, a person of very little consequence in their culture, and used that woman to play a major role in the story that he's writing. And we get to see that with Ruth as well. And so all of this brings us this week to what I consider the epilogue of the story. This is sort of our closing scene in Ruth chapter four, verses 13. Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. He slept with her and the Lord granted conception to her and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you without a family redeemer today. May his name become well known in Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Indeed, your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Naomi took the child, placed him on her lap, and became his nanny. The neighbor women said, a son has been born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And so in this first part of the epilogue, we see something really important happening. We see the birth of a son. If you remember in the beginning, we had Ruth and Naomi, and they didn't have any land or any heirs, and those were the two most important things in their culture, and they don't have any of it. And now this scene opens up with the restoration of both. See, at the beginning, it was hopeless. The men were dead. The women were barren. There wasn't a lot to put their hope in. But God pulls through for this family. God is showing us that this story in our story is part of a greater story, and God is not done redeeming. See, their land and their family have been restored, and we close this out with just this overwhelming sense of God's provision, that God provided for these people who were of little consequence to those around them. The emptiness of chapter one has been flipped upside down with the provision of a son. It's interesting because there's, in the midst of this, and it's almost easy to read right past this. And maybe you've noticed this as we've been working our way through the book of Ruth, but right here in verse 13 is only the second time that the narrator has, has overtly mentioned God's activity in what's taking place here, 
There is this, this sort of subtle, understated um, uh, idea of God's providence when, when Ruth goes out and she happens to end up in Boaz's field and, and he happens to be there this day. But this is only the second time that the author says overtly, hey, this is, God is doing this. This is his work here. If you look at verse 13, it says, the Lord granted her conception. He is providing this son to her. And in chapter 1, verse 6, was the first time, and that's when, when uh, Naomi finally gets word that there's food back in Bethlehem. The reason that they left, and they give this expression that God has provided for them once again. And now here, as this whole story is wrapping up, the narrator is demonstrating God's activity to provide. He's showing once again that God is actively working and moving in order to provide for Naomi, just as God had brought back the harvest in chapter one, now Yahweh comes to the aid of Ruth and Naomi through the birth of this son. Remember, when, when Ruth was living in, in, in Moab and she was married to Naomi's um, son, they, they never were able to conceive. They, there was no child born to them. They, they were probably most likely operating under the assumption that, that Ruth was barren. But now in, in this marriage to Boaz, in, in this child, we're, we're zoomed in on the details of their lives. And we're beginning to discover how God is going to come to their rescue. But beyond that, you, you can almost hear the narrator starting to show us that through the birth of this son, God is not only coming to the rescue of Ruth and Naomi, but God is working actively to come to the rescue of all of us through the provision of this child. I've used this illustration before, and, and some of you might remember it, but, but it always sticks out to me when we see an experience like this. When I was in high school, I had the opportunity to travel some to Albania on a short-term um, evangelism missions trip. And we, we had, went to Rome on our way back. We had a couple days there, and so we went and saw some of the, the St. Peter's Basilica and some of the sites throughout Rome, the Colosseum, and, and I got to see these incredible mosaics, beautiful pictures, uh, almost unlike anything I have ever seen in my life. But what stood out to me about that mosaic is, is that if you were to sort of zoom in on that, you would see hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of little broken, nondescript pieces. In fact, this is a mosaic, a portion of a mosaic taken from the Billy Graham Center in Wheaton. We might look at those individual tiles and they might be almost nondescript, unimpressive. Even if you saw it by itself, ugly, right? But when you zoom out and you discover that there is an artist who is placing each of those pieces in exactly the right place, exactly where he sees it fitting, when you, when you discover that there is someone who is painting a bigger picture that we might not yet have a full perspective on, we discover the beauty of what God is doing, the painting that he wants to paint. We begin to see that there's a greater story that is happening. We begin to discover that God is still in the work of redeeming. We've been looking at the jagged edges of these individual lives of people who are just trying to scrape by in the midst of this Old Testament story, but now we see that there is a bigger picture. You see, the story of, of Ruth, of Naomi, of Boaz, this story is affording us a, a bigger picture. It's giving us a unique perspective, and it reminds us that we can trust the artist. And so as we're beginning to zoom out and see the bigger picture, I don't want to miss still what's happening with this family, what's happening with the redemption of a family. And see here, we see this picture, and I can just picture it in my head of Naomi, and she's standing there, she's holding this baby. And the women of the town are all crowding around, craning their necks, probably trying to get a peek in, and maybe they're lifting up the blankets to try to see his little baby feet. And they're just heaping praise upon Naomi, but also upon the God who did this incredible work. Because what they see is that Naomi's once empty arms are now full with this long-awaited child. 
And as I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but think about our own long-awaited child here at Mill Creek. Many of you know Allie, who leads worship for us, and her husband, Jonathan. And when they decided to start their adoption story, the way that they just invited their community to be part of it, and we were all so excited, waiting to see what was going to happen, what God was going to do. And then Jaden came, and we were overcome with joy. And I remember the first Sunday they came in, and Allie had the little baby carrier, and just like a mad rush of everybody trying to peek in and get a look at this long awaited child. Because we were celebrating not only because everybody loves babies, we were celebrating God's faithfulness in their story. We were celebrating the story that we all got to be part of. And that's what seems to be happening here with these women. See, they seem to understand better than anybody else what the central message of this book is here. When they say in verse 14, God has not left you without a family redeemer. And as we're gonna find out, that message is true, not only for Naomi, but for all of us as well. You know, But as true as that is, it's also important to acknowledge that this moment, this joyful moment, doesn't just erase the pain of what's happened before. You know, I imagine Naomi, as she's holding that baby boy, she's probably thinking about what it felt like to hold her own baby boys of her sons who are no longer with her. See, redemption, it doesn't erase the past but it redeems it. It makes what is broken feel whole again. And that is the beauty of this moment right here. Yeah, and and, um, what's interesting about this is, is I think one of the challenges that we face in our faith, right, is when we read things like this and we're we're trying to understand, okay, what does this look like to us? Like, how do we experience this? And and, and, in my life and, and thousands of years later, what is this supposed to mean? And I think that, that this story, it's, it's helping us understand the nature of redemption. We see this in verse 15. There's, there's this line in here where the, the women are speaking to Naomi and they're talking about this little baby that she's holding. And he says, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. Like, that's a lot of pressure to put on a little baby, right? <laughs> that, that, that's a lot of expectation. But again, for Naomi, in a very practical way, this is what this meant for her. This meant being the, uh, uh, having the provision of, of the home of Boaz because of this baby. This meant that her family line and clan would continue on. In very real ways, this meant renewal of life and it meant security for the future. See, this is, this is what redemption does. Naomi is experiencing this and almost this, uh, this type of resurrection. What was described before as, as death and, and, and emptiness is now a renewal of life and security for the future. And so when Paul is talking about what redemption means and how we experience it and what it looks like to us, he says something very similar. This is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and, uh, verses four and 5. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ. Even though we were dead in trespasses, you are saved by grace. See, redemption isn't a a rehab of our life. It's not a fixer upper. It's where there was death, there is now life. It's a resurrection. And the book of Ruth is giving us this picture of, of what redemption looks like in the life of Naomi, so that we might understand it, that that we might desire it, that we might might recognize it when God's doing this work in in our own lives. And then there's at the end of that verse 15, there's this, this really, I think, poignant and extravagant saying. These women who are there and they're pouring all this praise over this baby, they say to Naomi, Ruth has been better to you than seven sons. Now, Again, Gretchen already hit on this, but if you remember, like if you were to think about what a cursed life looked like in Old Testament ancient Israel, it was you had no land and you had no heirs. And if you were to look at what the ideal life looked like in Old Testament Israel, it was that God had given you this plethora of sons to secure your line going forward. And they look at what Ruth or what Naomi has had in Ruth and they say, this is. This is better than seven sons. 
And the thing I want us to understand about what's unfolding here is they are acknowledging and recognizing this incredible blessing of God. When Naomi walked into Bethlehem, prior to this, they, they didn't even recognize her because her despair and weight was so heavy. She had this Moabite daughter-in-law that she was bringing with her. And now they're saying, you have been blessed beyond blessing because God has given you this daughter-in-law who's displayed this, this chesed love to you. And God is doing something unique. See, this is, this is the primary blessing of God in our life. It is his active work of redemption. And that's why you and I, even in the midst of the most difficult season of our life, we can call ourselves blessed because of what God has done for us. See, this is what redemption looks like. For Naomi, it was a, a child in her arms. It, was, it looks like the, the emptiness of death being replaced with the joy of life. And now in, in this story... A child in Naomi's arms, is she, it's redemption personified. See, God is, is telling a bigger story, a greater story. He is not done redeeming. And if this was where the story ended, it would be a really good story. It would be a perfect hallmark close to what's happened here. But it's not the end. You see, in verses 18 to 22, the narrator lets us know that God is up to something so much bigger. I'm going to read now 18 to 22 of chapter 4. Now these are the family records of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. Um, I've recently been getting into the Marvel movies, so no spoilers, please, because you're probably way ahead of me. But what I've learned really quickly is that one thing to look forward to is the post-credit scene. So when the movie is over and the boring names are scrolling across the screen, you keep watching and you wait because you're going to get one final scene, and that scene is going to be chock full of hints about what's to come. And that's sort of what I picture is happening right here. See, you wait through the credits because you know that something else is coming. And so after this closing scene with Naomi and the lights are fading to black and the name starts scrolling across the screen, the author drops a bomb about what's going to come next because now we see that this story is part of the line of a king. See, in in verses 18 to 22, we read this genealogy. and, And if you're anything like me or Eric, apparently, we skip over these parts because they're full of lots of names that we can't pronounce and things that we don't understand or have context for. But this is why the genealogies exist. They offer perspective. Similar to the mosaic, they are showing that God is writing a bigger story and the genealogies allow us to track his faithfulness throughout that story. Remember in the blessing, they referenced this kind of bizarre story with Perez and Tamar. And as we read in in this genealogy, that was at least six generations prior. I don't know about you, but I don't really know what was going on with my family six generations prior. But the reason why they tracked this was to give perspective of God's faithfulness, not just in their own lives, but over the generations that came before them. And see, as, as we have been looking at the details of these lives, looking at their stories and and what God is doing, the author now, the narrator, begins to zoom out. He begins to give us this fuller perspective. This story is the story of David, of of Israel's great king, the, the one who is going to restore order, he's going to bring justice back to the kingdom. All of that happened through the line of Boaz. Through, through the clan of, of a man who died in Moab named Elimelech, that most of us forget in the storyline. And if this is where the story ended, we would look at that and think, that is extraordinary. That, that is absolutely incredible. Nobody could have seen that coming. But again, this is not where the story ends. The apostle Matthew, if you flip over to uh, Matthew chapter 1, when he begins to tell his story of of the life of Christ, he picks things up where where, um, the story of Ruth leaves off. 
This is from the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. It says, an account of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers, and Judah fathered Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez fathered Hezron, and Hezron fathered Aram, and Aram fathered Abinadad, and Abinadad fathered Nashon. And Nishan fathered Salmon, and Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth, and Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered King David. Then jump to verse 15. Ilud fathered Eleazar, and Eleazar fathered Methan, and Methan fathered Jacob, and Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, who gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Christ. See, Matthew picks up on the story of Naomi and, and Ruth and Boaz, the narrator who's telling this story of a child in a culture that's so much different of our own, says, against all odds, this, this little baby who almost didn't happen, this little baby is going to be in the line of the king David, Israel's great king. But beyond that, Israel's, this baby, beyond being uh, in the line of Israel's great king, he is in the line of the ultimate king. See, what was happening generations earlier is not only for the provision of this family living in Bethlehem. This is for the provision of all of us. These events, these decisions that they were making in a barley field thousands of years ago would bring us to Israel's great king, David. And it would be through the line of that king, David, that God would send their Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it is by this Messiah that you and I are reconciled to God. See, this is, this is the great story. This is his redeeming work. The, the narrator concludes by zooming out to see how the events in the lives of three people impact the greater redemptive narrative. The story that all of scripture is telling. And here's the thing. We're in the story. We find ourselves in the story. What's happening here is for our salvation. This is the story of how God would redeem us. And so as the narrator zooms out, I want you to zoom back in. I, I want you to understand that this is for you. That when, in verse 14, as Gretchen mentioned, when he said, God has not left you without a guardian redeemer, that's for you. God has not left you without a guardian redeemer. This week's sermon's called The Legacy of Faith. And as I've been sort of mulling that phrase over, in my head, I've been thinking about people with a really rich faith heritage, people like Sterling or the people in these stories with their generations of faithful people following after God. And when I hear stories like that, um, I feel inspired, but I also feel a little uh, twinge of pain and sadness as well, because my family doesn't really look like that. I don't really have a legacy of faith. You see, both my parents became Jesus freaks in college, and so they had to start their own legacy. In fact, on both sides, we have a legacy of alcoholism and atheism and drug abuse and broken families and a whole lot of dysfunction mixed in there. But then I look at Ruth and I think her heritage was a bit of a mess too. See, Ruth was a Moabite, which means her entire people group was descended from an act of incest. Not a great legacy. And yet, she gets to be part of the lineage of Jesus. I don't know your family, but I do know this. You are part of a greater story, and God is not done redeeming. You know, in my family, a lot of the dysfunction came from my grandpa Louie. He was a pretty severe alcoholic, and it caused him to lose um, his family and jobs and eventually almost be sent to prison. He was a pretty uh, rough around the edges kind of guy. But towards the end of his life, as his health started to fail, my mom invited him to move across the country and move in with us. And in the 14 weeks that my grandfather spent in our home, he got to see the gospel lived out up close. He got to see people that loved each other in a messy, imperfect way 
but in a way that looked a little something like what the love of Christ looks like. And through those 14 weeks, he was able to understand, probably more clearly than most people do, that he was a man in desperate need of redemption, and he found it. He found that redemption in this prayer that was messy and complicated and probably involved more than a few curse words. You see, in that moment, my grandfather called out to his redeemer and he found it. And our story became a legacy of faith in reverse, of the younger generation's faithfulness influencing the older generations. And so if you're here this morning and you've been listening to our series, there's a couple things I want you to remember, a couple of big ideas that I think we learned from the gospel, or from the story of Ruth. The first one is that your past sin or your past loss does not cancel out your future hope. There's nothing that God can't redeem, there's nothing that God can't fix, there's nothing that's too far gone. My grandpa might have been somebody that I thought was too far gone. But God proved me wrong, and I'm so thankful that he did because God's redemption reaches so much farther than we can imagine. And the second thing I want us to remember is that the same God at work in this story is the God at work in your life. This morning we've been talking so much about the idea of perspective and what it's like to sort of see the whole picture. I don't know what your perspective is today. I don't know if you're up here and you're seeing it and it looks pretty good, or if you're stuck in a valley and you can't see over the walls around you. Remember in this story that God is working all the things, all the details you can't see, all the jagged and broken edges, he is taking all of it and he's turning it into something beautiful. You can trust in his redeeming work because you are part of that greater story and God is not done redeeming yet. So this morning, as we conclude this series, we, we had the opportunity to respond. You know, Jesus, in, in his sovereignty and wisdom, knew that as the church, we were going to need something to remind us of his redemptive work, of what he accomplished. And he gave us communion, um, a symbol of, of his ability to take that which is broken and to pay a price that we could not pay, uh, uh, pay in order to do a work that we could not do. This morning, we're gonna conclude by, by coming to the Lord's table. If you are here with us and you're new, um, this table does not belong to Chapel Street Church. You don't have to be a member of this church. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have um, placed your faith in him for the forgiveness of sins, you're invited to, to join us for communion. In a moment, the ushers will come and they will pass the plates and you'll see two stacks, uh, two uh, cups stacked together. Grab both of those and hold on to them. And then in a moment, um, Gretchen and I will come and lead us in the taking of the cup and the taking of the bread. Would you pray with us? Father, we have, um, Lord, we've been looking at the story of the gospel through a very different set of lenses over these last six weeks. And God, in three people who were living in obscurity in ancient Bethlehem, um, that you were doing something that, that neither they nor the people around them could see, but you were working towards what we now celebrate, the, the ability of your son to come and to provide redemption for all of humanity. God, I pray that the implications of this story would ring true in our lives that we would be able to capture the greater story and that we would understand your work of redemption. Meet us at your table this morning and it's in your name we pray, amen.